also, did you uh, ever go to Al's Beef or Mario's Italian Lemonade Stand? Was it was that around on Taylor Street near Loomis? Or no, I never went to any of the stores. Uh, I I was there just to work. <laughs> That's and, uh, it. That was getting up uh, early in the morning, and it wasn't a clean place. And I remember very clearly um, the tables that I used to put on the street every week. I would keep them in a store, um, and that store was a fish store. A fish store, really? Fish store. And oh so my gosh. the smell of a fish store on Maxwell Street, I got to tell you. <laughs> But I, but I, it, but I made a lot of money. Um, Maxwell Street was a, truly a cash cow, and uh, there would be a guy that some politician that would walk by uh, uh, during the morning, and he would expect to be paid. And I think I, I gave him uh, ten or fifteen dollars, and and he would go to the. It, it, he would just collect the fees. I don't know what he did with the money. So how old were you at the time? Um, I was in, in my teens. Oh, wow. Upper teens. That, yeah, and so how early would you have to get there? Well, I got up at 5 in the morning in my house. I was down there like at 6 and uh, to set up, get the tables out, get all the food prepped. Um, the You'd have cap- to get all the groceries and food, oh, right? Right. I always had to get the groceries uh but that was normally done the night before, thrown in the car. Um, and so it, it all worked out. So are those good memories or not good memories? You know, I have to look back at all my memories as being good memories. Uh, yeah. It was a lot of hard work. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, um, a gentleman who was uh, about six foot six foot six or six foot seven and he would walk around with a bar and he would hang two heavy people on and have the bar in his mouth what and he would walk and he was a friend of mine <laughs> it's a good person to have a friend as a friend right you didn't want to fool around with me knowing this guy was my friend so that was kind of a cool was thing. he selling something or what was he doing um he just took donations oh um and he'd pick up Two people on the street. I'm sure they had to be a little balanced. He didn't, what he didn't want to do was get someone light right. on one side and someone heavy on the other. Yeah, yeah. What were you selling at the time uh, on Maxwell Street? Slicers, knives, those kind of things. All mostly food products. Okay. In fact, they were all food products. Yeah. Were they ones your dad's products that you got from this factory? or uh, A lot of them. Um, most of them were. Right. Yeah, yeah. I always like to get one fun fact about someone that most people don't know. You've been interviewed a lot of times, your book. What what do most people don't know about you? Uh, well, most people most people haven't read my book. Uh, I when I think of my book, I always think of the the most my most embarrassing moment, which is Did you read my book? Uh, three times. And do you remember what my most embarrassing moment was? Did you say in the book, this is my most embarrassing <clears throat> moment? Was it, I, I mean, sure. I have a couple, the shoe shine story rings about, I don't know if the shoe shine story was it with uh, the, that turned his boots complete. Was that it? General. The general, it's yeah. Most embarrassing. That was the. I'll most have you tell that though. Uh, yeah, that's a, and I like what you did after his boot. I'm not even going to tell the story, but well, after his, story. yeah, you'll tell the story. Yes. Okay. Five and one friar, who we got to talk about, well, right? Five and one friar is, uh, All right. is a good thing to talk about. It's a lot of, a lot of work, man. I, I feel like I'm poor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm poor and I'm dying to make a few dollars to survive and I have to work these long hours. And, and it's good motivation, right? I'm in a 16,000 square foot home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Ron Popeil, top inventor, who's one of the legends of sales, infomercials, and direct response marketing. Over the last 40 years, Ron's products have pulled in more than $2 billion in sales. 
He is most famous for products and infomercials like the Showtime Rotisserie, where he says, set it and forget it, the Chopomatic, the Vegematic, the Food Dehydrator, and for using the phrase, but wait, there's more. And there is more. He's still going strong. His latest product, the five in one fryer, which can cook a 15 pound turkey in 46 minutes. If you can believe that, you got to watch the infomercial for yourself. And you could check out his products innovations at ronco.com or 5in1fryer.com. Ron, thank you for joining me. Thank you, but wait, there's more. <laughs> when, so, you talk, when, yeah. when you talk about what makes the, my uh, fryer do a 15 pound turkey in 46 minutes, yeah. the, the fryer, the turkey is bigger than the fryer. Right. And that's what makes it so fascinating. People, to build a, a fryer, you can build a big box, throw the oil in, put the turkey in it, have the oil cover the turkey, but no one's gonna buy it because most people have small kitchens. Right. So the key to the invention is to try to make something small uh, that does big stuff. Yeah. That's key. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if this will work because I've never, uh, I haven't done too much Skyping before, but uh, maybe this will give your audience an idea. Yeah. If I hold that up like that, it's going to the printing will be yeah. back. You can but see it. Yeah. See that? Yeah. How does that turkey fit <laughs> in that fryer? You got to go to fiveandonefryer.com to figure it out. Right. And that's the infomercial it is as well. Yeah. And I want you to talk a little bit about the process, how you came up with it, some of the steps. Well, but before you do that, yeah. I, I want to ask you. Go ahead. How does that turkey fit in the fryer? Well, I mean, they have to watch the infomercial to find out. Have you seen the infomercial? Yeah, of course I have. Oh, okay, then yeah. you know how. Okay. Yeah, I know how, yeah. Got it. Because it's interesting, you know, there's, you know, you have to clip it and obviously flip it. Yeah, I'll let, you know, they should watch it. But absolutely, just all the elements are interesting of that particular infomercial because the stuff that is just subtle stuff is powerful. Like where you show the frying oil, you know, when you someone drops something in like to the frying oil originally that basically kind of splatters up, you know, yes. and, and yeah, that is powerful. Well, everybody that cooks food today Mm -hmm. normally fries food. Um, even though so many people are on health kicks, people are still eating French fries, fried chicken, um, fried zucchini sticks, fried mushrooms, great down south fried ice cream, fried Oreo cookies, mm -hmm. corn dogs. Um, and most people around the world do not have a fryer. And what they do is they take a frying pan, they put oil in it, turn on the flame or it's an electric stove and it's heated up that way and the oil gets hotter and hotter. At one point in time, if you leave it on long enough, it's gonna catch on fire, it's gonna combust. It splatters, it splatters right. you, yeah. But yeah. when you put a piece of frozen food in that has some moisture in it, like frozen chicken strips or french fries, when that food hits the oil and every man that's watching your show has ever seen his wife or his wife has seen him frying something on a frying pan with a lot of hot oil in it, they always say, be, be careful. Yes. Because it is going to splatter. Someone very well may get burned or you have a small fire in your house. And so that was the motivating factor to try to create a fryer, a fryer that was super safe mm -hmm. with my fryer. Uh, when the food hits the oil, the lid falls down so you can't be splattered. If you put too much food or too much oil in the machine and it rises up, it gets to a level where it goes into holes, causing the oil to go between the inner and the outer so it doesn't get on your counter. And of course, when you're using the safety extension sleeve, uh, when you're doing that turkey, it's so high that oil can't even come near the top. So it's a super, super safe machine and the only machine in the world that has passed the new uh, high standards of big food fryers of Underwriter Laboratory, the only one. Hmm. So I've kind of been set aside as a pretty safe fryer. 
So what was the, the Ron, what made you create it? What was the idea? I mean, did you splatter? Because you could create no. anything. First, no, yeah. you cannot, cannot create anything. I would have loved to have created uh, Velcro or computer. <laughs> but those are the kind of things uh, that I look at as, you know, Velcro, my favorite. Come on. Who doesn't think of that little tiny thing? And I used to have a home in Aspen, and we used to see these uh, little things on the on the mountain before the the summertime, and and that's where the idea came from how to do Velcro. Uh, I wish that's a real invention. <laughs> um, the, there was a lot of publicity uh, on turkey fryers outside, burning houses down. Hmm. Um, uh, a lot of people getting hurt, and every Thanksgiving, uh, Underwriter Laboratory and the fire department and CNN, they keep showing decks catching on fire, and it truly is the most dangerous <laughs> product on the planet. And anybody that's ever had a fried turkey knows that fried turkeys are absolutely delicious, and of course, that market is small for people who fry turkeys, mm -hmm. but the people who hear about how great a fried turkey tastes, yeah. that's where the real market is mm -hmm. uh, in North America. Of course, my product also does leg of lamb, and of course, leg of lamb is all over the world. So doing big food, roast beef and that kind of stuff, it's just not solely designed for a turkey, but North America, turkeys or where it's at. Anyway, that was the, one of the motivating factors to start. Yeah. The other was the safety reason that I talked about earlier. And putting those two together with a small kitchen and trying to create something small that did stuff that was big, right. that's, that's where the problems uh, come into play. Yeah. Um, in the infomercial, um, and I don't know if it's in the latter infomercial, but I remember uh, doing one infomercial that said um, that never got to the air was that we did 20,000 pounds of turkey wow. in my kitchen to test the product. In essence, it was closer to 30,000 pounds of turkey. Wow. I received turkeys from two major companies who supplied turkeys over the last bunch of years complimentary to me when they saw the prototype and they thought it would increase the turkey business. And so truckloads of turkeys would come to my house frozen. And of course I have a lot of freezers in my house and um, that's a lot of turkeys to test. I, you're probably going to ask me what I did with all the turkeys. Of turkey. course, yeah. What are you gonna, what? Well, we have a fire station down the street and uh, they were a recipient and of course we got a lot of turkeys uh, to the homeless people uh, fresh fried whole turkeys come on they love you yeah yeah they did they did so Ron what were some of the I mean some people would hear those things and go I don't want to be in the frying business if you know there's a lot of liability things are catching on fire what were some of the steps you went through to to bring it to market well the first as a the product originally, I was thinking about health also. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I'm the world's I'm the world's largest collector of olive oil. Mm -hmm. I'm in the Guinness World Be Book of Records. I have a ranch and I produce my own olive oil. I'm not an expert on olive oil though, even though I'm the world's largest collector of it. Um, when you, when you think about frying food, you th and the people uh, that are into the health aspect of not wanting to eat fried food, right. I wanted to do something in that arena. And so I started looking into oils that, in particular, olive oil. And most chefs around the country will say that olive oil is not good for frying because it doesn't have a high smoking point. And it's true when it comes to extra virgin, which is the most expensive, and virgin, which is the one underneath it, uh, those have uh, low smoking points. 
But there is one olive oil, which is the cheapest one you can buy in the supermarket, called pure or regular olive oil. Right. And it has a high smoking point. And so I wanted to push that. I've backed off of it a little bit. Um, Why? Well, because I wanted to open the world to other oils because whether you're using pure olive oil and olive oil is healthier, yeah. um, you can use corn oil, you can use canola oil, you can use the vegetable oil, you can use grapeseed oil, and they all work the same. Um, the pure olive oil is slightly more money than the canola vegetable and corn oil. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are concerned about budgets. And so I didn't want to close the door of that huge audience who said, well, Ron, I'm not worried about health. Uh, corn oil is just fine for me. Canola, vegetable, I'll buy the cheaper oils as long as you tell me that the results are going to be exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And they are exactly the same. And so uh, that was one thing that I started in a heavier fashion and then tapered off to the to the less expensive oils. Yeah, cuz you still mention it in the infomercial. But very little. Very yeah. And if you notice the apron I was wearing, it says Ron Popol's olive oil fryer. Yes. Yes, yeah. I did. And so the original infomercial had a lot more olive oil is healthier in it. Mm. And I've tapered it off in the show. Yeah. Yeah. So what were some of the steps you went through? Because it's not, you know, it's maybe easy to use, but it's probably not easy to formulate all those components. How did well, you... Let's analyze the frying. But don't yeah. keep in mind, it's a five-in-one fryer. It makes bread. It flavor steams. It boils. It does a lot of other things. Pasta. Other yeah. than, than fry. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we're just talking about frying. Um Let's take turkeys, for instance. Um, a turkey ranges anywhere from nine and a half pounds up to um, up to 20, 25 pounds. Underwriter Laboratory will not allow any food to be fried in your kitchen and get an approval if it's more than 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. So now we're locked in to that 15 pound window and nothing more than that for indoor fryers. But you have a nine pound turkey, a 10, 11, a 12, um, a 13 and a half. They're not always exact. And so every weight has a different amount of oil hmm. that goes in the machine. And because the bigger the turkey, the less oil you need. The smaller turkeys use around five quarts of oil, by the way, which is the maximum underwriter laboratory will allow is five liters anywhere in the, in the world. We use maximum five quarts, a little bit less than the maximum uh, that we can go to. Um, so if you have a nine pound turkey, 10 pound turkey, it's gonna be in the range of five quarts. When you get all the way up to 15 pounds, it's going to be almost a quart less, about four quarts of oil. So learning the exact and the amount of time for each turkey is different. Now we give you a chart and a DVD and a big sheet. Big sheet is how to try a turkey in my machine with big print because I hate to read things that have small print. And so we give you that big sheet, you get a DVD, that, the video that shows you step by step. Um, so the customer understands with the chart, a 14 pound turkey takes three and a half quarts of oil and it cooks for 38 minutes. It tells you exactly um, how easy it is. And doing a turkey is pretty easy. Mm -hmm. What were some of the challenges when you were coming up with the, the invention? Well, how do you protect the splashing aspect of um, 
the dangerous frying pan. Um, a cute thing happened. I was Flavor Flav, the rapper, and, I'm, uh, and I hate rap. I'm not a, sorry. Uh, but he's one of my favorite people on the planet. I was at his house for Fourth of July, which was like being where there was a big bomb because <laughs> he shoots off a lot of fireworks and he gets arrested almost every year doing that. Well, wonderful guy, though. Great talent. And I, he was um, frying some food in a frying pan. And he had a lot of people over. I was not there at that dinner. Uh, but some of my friends were. And the oil was splashing everybody. And someone screamed out, hey, that's not a set it and forget it product. And that got back to me. And then I started thinking about the frying pan. And what you were talking about earlier as I introduce uh, the show, the early part of the show about people frying foods and are you afraid of being burned or having a fire in your kitchen when frying foods with frozen chicken strips? Like, I've solved the problem. When the food hits the oil in my machine, the lid is in place. You cannot be splashed. And that in and of itself is um, a pretty nice thing to have on a fryer. The holes that go around, they're, most of the stuff is patented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oil rising up, go into the holes. doesn't overflow. That overflow idea, if you look at outdoor turkey fryers, the big problem is, is they lower the turkey in the hot oil and the displacement causes the oil to overflow and right. propane underneath it. Right. Pinko. And so that really opens my new show. I don't know if you saw the my latest infomercial uh, that I'm just starting to air. But, and by the way, I shot that in, at my house in Beverly Hills, right outside my front door. And I, and I shot it on my iPhone. Really? Yeah. I do all the shooting. Um, we did have the, the uh, infomercial show that was done uh, in a studio. But all the food shots, the styling, um, all of that is done by myself. Wow. I do, the, I do most of the editing, uh, the voiceovers. Fortunately, my sister uh, teaches voice. Um, and she's really good at it, and she has all this great equipment. So I'm running over to her house all the time doing voiceovers, taking something out, putting something in better. Um, coming up the other day, um, hash brown potatoes. Did you know that you could buy frozen hash browns in the supermarket like 20 cents a piece? No. You get 10 of them in a package for two bucks at Walmart. Um, people that are hooked on McDonald's hash browns, I'm thinking, wow, just show them a moment there. Show them in a, just a couple minutes time. You have all the hash browns for your family in the morning, uh, something that they relate to when they go to McDonald's or they have that, that hunger for biting into one of those hash browns. Uh, I think you know what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you're not one of those health nuts. There. I am actually. I'm very healthy, but I like the non healthy too. Good. I'm, yeah. I'm both. Yeah. I'm both. So, Ron, what iteration is this? This model that you see. How many iterations did it take to get to this version? Hmm. Because I'm sure well, out of the gate not, you'd wait, add in, stuff. in the infomercial uh, for the benefit of your audience mm -hmm. in the infomercial if you look at the background of I'm only on the show at the early part yeah. introducing but in the background you will see some of the prototypes yeah you see them yeah the different shapes um, they some were bigger than others uh, some were triangular some were too big for anybody's kitchen right and you keep working at it to narrow it down um, and you, you finally end up with, uh, at, the problem is this, most of my inventions take two to two and a half years to create. Mm -hmm. This one, 13 and a half years. Wow. 
13 and a half years, about $4 million Jeez, out of pocket. Um, we're not charge. I don't charge for time. Uh, this is testing foods, uh, the fruits and the vegetables and the other meats, um, the cost of getting patents, um, prototyping, farming prototyping out, travels to China, working with manufacturers. I could write a whole book on doing business with manufacturers in China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, you, you can't believe anything over there. That's uh, the bottom line. So why would you stick with it? Your usual is two and a half to three years. After five years, why were you like, forget it. This is, I could have already Thank done three products. Um, I did a, uh, I received an award once. Uh, and that, that particular award, I had to give a speech. And I remember saying, uh, relating to what Winston Churchill once said, never, 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 never give up. And um, I just, um, I'm, that's, it, it, it's part of my DNA. And so, but I, whether this project will be successful or not, I have no idea. Um, the whole business is of television marketing is so different today than it was when I first started. And um, there's something to be said for when everybody was watching TV mm -hmm. to hardly anybody watching TV. The unfortunate thing is the TV stations have not dropped their prices in commensurate with the size of the audience. And, and that's the problem uh, of marketing products on TV. You have to go to retail. Uh, you have to be in all those other venues, uh, the social media. And that's a whole learning curve in and of itself. And not only are there, you know, yeah. not as many people watching TV, but there's also back then there are less channels. I mean, now people have a thousand channels. I remember um, I have some, so many cute stories. Um, I remember, well, everybody watched TV. And the biggest program on TV when it first started was wrestling. That wrestling? Was white. Now, I don't know if you were born then, but wrestling was the biggest really? TV. Really? Uh, number one, without a doubt. Argentine Rocca. Some of the older people that are watching say, well, I remember him or Benito Gardini who always used to use his head because he used to strangle when the referee wasn't watching. Um, I remember uh, after the business got started, we were I was instantly successful. Um, there, and there have been so many products. Um, I took in my best friend as a partner and he bought the media. And I remember I lived in Chicago and we had a, a two minute, a one minute commercial on a product. And in those days we would put product um, in stores and there was no 800 numbers and things of that nature. And we show the product and direct them to go to a, a chain of stores like Walgreens or Thrifty, or those kind of stores, um, Woolworths. And uh, the Blackhawks somehow, last minute, um, were going to be on TV in Chicago. And the TV station had no advertisers. It, it, they put it together too soon, too late. Ah. And weren't able to get advertisers. Yeah. So I had my partner call up his contact at the station, and they already had the commercial. And they ran the commercial in the between the first period and the second period. That was great, man. A huge audience. And the price of the spot was uh, 100 and 
$125 or $150. The total cost for a one-minute spot for the whole city of Chicago. And everyone's and, watching the game, probably. And, and every, right. And they made a little mistake. The station announcer made a little mistake at the end. And he didn't read it exactly right. And I said, call him back. I said, call up the station and get a, a, a free one. A make, they call it a make good. And, and they agreed that it, it was a mistake. And uh, they ran it between the second and third period. Still the same 150 bucks. And then I said, Mel, if they make another mistake, it's <laughs> he said, well, the game will be over with then. I said, but if it, maybe there'll be an overtime. Make sure that if they make a mistake again, you call back and you get it in between the end of the, the game and the overtime. And don't you think they made a mistake? We got a third spot in after the game was right over with, and we got three spots uh, in the whole big city of Chicago and its outlying area, all for a hundred and fifty dollars. It was it's the deal of the lifetime, the deal of the century, right? Right. So what One, happened? Did they well, sold a lot of product in stores? Yeah. Of course, we sold a lot of product in stores. Are you kidding? How do you fulfill that and with all that demand? Is it sometimes well, that the product was already in the stores? We drove people to go to those stores, mm -hmm. and of course, the more advertising, uh, the more people are going to see it. More people are going to be convinced. It's provided that the, they know you produce good stuff. The prices has to be right within their price range in those days, um, I think that product was nine ninety five, and uh, available at all Woolworths and Walgreens, and they instantly uh, mm -hmm. sold out. Yeah, and you mentioned, around the, uh, you know, now it's a little bit different than it was before. What's working best lately in selling the 501 Fryer? Well, the 501 Fryer just came out, so it really... Oh, really? Okay. It's it's brand new. Uh, most people have not seen it. Um, the the you have to go to retail and the social media, as I said earlier, to be successful on TV today. You cannot, I believe, you cannot put a product together and just go on TV and expect to get sufficient orders to cover the cost of the media. Mm -hmm. And that's a serious problem. If TV time costs nothing, every piece of product you'd sell, you'd make a profit. So it is the cost of media that determines your profitability. The one thing about the infomercial business and direct response business that most people do not know is that when you buy an airing, and let's say you buy a, a spot on CNBC at four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. what, forget what the station says, how big their audience is. How many people bought your product? How many people got on the phone and ordered it? Whatever that number is, that's what you can expect to get the following Sunday, the following Sunday, the, within a 10% range, that's what it's going to be hmm. probably for the next year or year and a half. Now you can quantify what that spot is worth because it's only going to bring in X number of orders. Right. Most people don't know that. It doesn't run, you're going to get uh, 50 orders and then Next week, you're going to run the same show. It has to be apples and apples. Right. Same time, same show. And you're going to get 2,000. That's never going to happen. It's always going to be within that 10% range. Um, today, the business has changed because you have phone calls and you have a website. 
wait a second. You get so many phone calls and you can determine where those calls, from what spot those phone calls came from. Right. But collectively, if you're running 300 stations across the country and they're all feeding the website, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. Now, you can, if you have a, a defined amount of money and a defined amount of time, look at the percentage and stop how many phone calls came in and how many total uh, website orders came in, then you could look at a percentage and say, well, for every, every call I get on the phone, I get two uh, website orders. Um, I think it's more than closer to 50-50 as I'm testing it right now. Mm -hmm. But retail is the, you need that out there. Uh, because the TV stations have not dropped their price in commensurate with the size of the audience drop. And it has dropped substantially, especially to the younger the younger kids out there. Is that why QVC and Home Shopping Network is desirable for people? Because they don't... When TV time costs you nothing, right. every piece of product you sell you make a profit. It's uh, and their audiences are wonderful. QVC is a lot bigger than uh, HSN. Um, I'm going to be on QVC. I found out yesterday. Nice. I'm going to introduce the five and one fryer, turkey fryer, on April the nineteenth, with a small quantity of product. Um, but I'm trying to figure that what I'm going to do now, um, sure, frying a turkey, that's pretty simple, but I said it's a five of one. It makes bread, coffee can and dole pineapple can breads, um, fruit and nut breads, pizza bread. How about a ham, scrambled egg, and cheese breakfast toast in the morning? I mean, stuff that you, right. it boils. Easter's coming up. You can you can boil over a hundred eggs in that machine, <laughs> less than twenty minutes of boiling time. Um, it does a lot of pasta you mentioned earlier. Yeah, it boils pasta and it also strains it too. Right. Yes. And then it flavor steams. Do you know what flavor steaming is? No. Flavor steaming is where you take. Uh, we demonstrated in the infomercial where we take some red wine, some little water, some fresh whole cloves of garlic, some fresh rosemary and thyme, and that comes to a boil, and the steam that comes up from that, it's a basket that has a whole chicken in it, or a roast beef in it, and it, it steams, that flavor steams that big chunk of food, and in one hour, it picks up the flavor of the of the liquid mm -hmm. that was boiling underneath it. We were doing it with beer the other day, just taking up making a beer flavored chicken. Then we took the liquid out, put some oil in the fryer. It takes thirteen minutes to heat the oil, and we just fried that flavored steamed chicken uh, for about five minutes, which seared the outside. Because steamed food doesn't look that great. Right, steamed. right, right. And it doesn't so, get that golden brown on the outside, yeah. Right. So, and that's something else I had, uh, thought about when the turkey. When we do a turkey, we take a quart of a cup of pancake syrup, the cheapest pancake syrup you can buy, with two cups of warm water, douse the whole turkey with it, and dry it thoroughly. That's going to give you a nice dark mm, turkey. Interesting, yeah. And we do that with all our turkeys. If you want it darker, put a touch more syrup in the water. If you want it lighter, don't put as much syrup in the water. Interesting, color, now you can color the turkey as light or as dark as you like it when you fry it. Same thing with the chicken or a duck. So Ron, how are you not fatter? I mean, <laughs> if I were you, I would be obese. 
I, you know what I did today, and I felt fat today. This morning, um, I buy a lot of, I'm a good customer at QVC. Uh, I understand, they do buy quality. And I was watching their show the other day, and they had these crab cakes on, and they were round. And of course, the, the guy selling it, and they sell a lot of them on a continuity program where they order and they keep sending them to you. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of pricey, but they are as good a crab cakes as you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. And they're round. So I'm thinking, he's telling them to put them in the oven. Anytime you have to use your oven, you're going to use a lot of electricity uh, or gas. And so I said, I like what, what people like about fried food is it's crunchy on the outside and soft textured on the inside. And so what happens if you take those crab cakes and you fry them? Well, they arrived yesterday from QVC and I last night, um, I put them away and this morning I couldn't wait to come downstairs in my kitchen. So what do you do? Do you fry the whole, take the whole frozen thing, put a bunch of them in the basket, drop them in the hot oil? Is that going to work? Maybe I would, I would do that, yeah. Maybe not yeah. because the, the, the crab cake is a nice round ball and for the time it takes for that hot oil to permeate through something that frozen, is going to take too long and the longer it's in the oil the darker it's going to get and so the first thing I did was take the crab cakes the balls and I just put them in the microwave for one minute out of there then I put them in the basket and let them cook for three minutes perfect so now, when I go on QVC, I can relate to all the people or talk to all the people who buy their crab cakes and other foods that are breaded and say, hey, wait, forget the oven. Here's a faster way to do it. And you're going to get the crunch. You're always it's experimenting. Like, and we're going to go after people who buy those crab cakes and are watching me on QVC. I buy those crab cakes. That's a good reason to buy the fryer. Mm -hmm. But I still had to do, I still had to put the whole thing in frozen to see what would happen. Right. And I was correct. In eight minutes time, the middle of the crab cake was not hot. Mm. 10 minutes, I'm sorry. Too much time. Too much, too much time. Opt for the first one. The instructions will be, one minute in the microwave, three minutes in the fryer, you'll have the the food the way you like it. So that I thought I did that this morning. Um, so after all these pitches, Ron, you still have to think about what you're going to include. Like how long will you have on QVC? Um, they haven't told me, but in monitoring shows um, to prepare, I look at other people that go on their shows and come up with the conclusion that it will be about 16 minutes. Hmm. And that's tough. It's not tough if it was a rotisserie, because a rotisserie does one thing. It rotisserie, right. chicken, yeah. roast beef, leg of lamb, this, this, same thing. And you actually see it as a truly, we call it the showtime rotisserie, because it, I call it, it was a show to me. That's why I named it uh, Showtime. This here is a little difficult because everything takes place inside the container. Mm -hmm. So, and you got to show how to do the turkey. You got to show how it does French fries, four rock Cornish hens at one time, um, two five, two, two and a half pound lobsters. Um, I was doing dumplings this morning, fried dumplings. You got to show chicken. Um, should you make the fried chicken on the show? Those are the kind of things you have to work out ahead of time. And then the bread making, and then the boiling, and then the flavor steaming. Right. Well, you got 16 minutes. 
And yeah, you know, so what do you do? And you know the show host is going to want to talk somewhere. And how do you get it all in? Yeah. It's going to be quite trying. I will do it. Somehow these things do get done. Yeah. But they have to be well thought out. Um, what order are you, are you going to do it? Are you going to do the turkey right away? I think not. I think I'm going to take one minute and have four machines because you don't you don't see the sleeve. I want to keep them guessing a little bit how that turkey fits on the machine. Right. So do some show them the fried chicken coming up, or take four of those machines, get four quick shots of food, and then um, take the machine apart, show the different safety features, how the cord is magnetic. Uh, so if you accidentally hit it, it won't knock over your machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then show the turkey. And then show some more fried foods. And then go into, the. I'll be carving a leg of lamb, I know. Um, and then go into the boiling and the flavor steaming and the baking. And, and then talk price. Because the customer at QVC always gets a better price than anyone else. So the same package that I'm selling on TV, exact same package in this situation. Normally it isn't the exact. In this situation, it is. The exact same package, the customer will save um, at least $40 if she buys it on QVC. And it's a real saving. And I have to pitch that to them. At this point, do you have to pitch it to them? I mean, you probably had a relationship with them for how many years? Do they still treat you like everyone else? Jeremy, you learn one thing in my business. Yeah. You're only as good as your last product. I don't sit on the laurels. There's the rotisserie did a billion, 400 million in sales, something like that. Uh, most of my products, the food dehydrator was big item, um, yeah. six, seven hundred million. All, all the items normally do a half a billion in that category. Um, but it's it, they're labors of love. Um, I don't have to work. Um, right. It's not like uh, it's not like I remember uh, when I was younger. Uh, I was on a a curb in New York City and I remember how hungry I was. I don't remember how old I was. Like physically uh, hungry, you mean? Physically hungry, yeah. yeah. And I remember cold and I was of course I was in an orphanage uh, for a few years. So uh, my father's parents, my grandparents, uh, took us my brother and I out of the orphanage up in upstate New York and uh, I didn't have a good relationship with my grandfather. My grandmother spent her life in the kitchen and I learned everything from cleaning toilets to floors to washing dishes to doing everything uh, in those days uh, a grandmother, a good grandmother would do and, and so picking up of an SOS Brillo soap pad and scrubbing pots and pans. Um, that was part of my world. And it has helped me today in uh, creating product and the way people think. Um, I, owe, I, I, I owe an awful lot to her. Do you think that's why you gravitate towards the kitchen products? Yes, always. And from a marketing standpoint, everybody's got a kitchen. And everybody that my wife doesn't visit the kitchen too often. <laughs> well, you're cooking a thousand pounds of turkey, so she doesn't need to. No, it's not the turkeys, but oh. lots of other dishes. Uh, I have two little girls. Uh, they're excellent cooks. Um, they do a lot of baking. Um, and one of my other daughters is a chef. Um, all, the, all the kids cook well. 
all except my wife. <laughs> my wife cooking. We won't have her watch this. I don't want you uh, sleeping on the couch. It's okay. okay. <laughs> so what keeps you going, Ron? Like you said, you don't have to work. What what keeps you driving ahead? I don't know. It's um could be uh self accomplishment. Um um I doing nothing I think I would get super bored um, I think a, a lot anybody they people think you know if you if you didn't have to work you wouldn't work if you've worked most of your life it's pretty forget that you've come into a situation where you don't have to um, it's a force um, the guy I look up to, everybody has an idol. Uh, yeah. I had the privilege of working with Steve Wynn for mm. 22 years. I was on his board of directors, and and he's a great friend. And I watched him work up close. Um, you know, there's there's a guy, and he he's um, got a lot more than me, and he works every bit as hard as I do. Except that he's better at everything. He's truly one of those guys. You know that old saying, "Jack of all trades, master of none." He truly is a master of all trades. Really? Yeah, genius at everything he does. Amazing, just amazing. I'm good at a few things. What did you see up close working with him closely? He had a saying: "Deliver the promise." He has a a feel for what his his customer wants and he's capable of delivering it. He has a talent that that draws great talent to him. If you talk to him, you succumb. And uh, if you're good at what you do, he'll recognize it. And you want to be with him because mm -hmm. you'll be going places. And so I learned a great deal from uh, hanging around him. Yeah. So Ron, you know, obviously you early on, you didn't have success handed to you. Talk a little bit about what was the, your childhood like? Mm. Well, I met my father when I was 15 or 16 years old. I never knew my mother. Um, work was the call of the day, uh, and uh, I could sell. I had an innate talent for selling, and um, getting on, a, standing on, going to state fairs every summer, twelve-hour days cutting up a lot of food, um, making a lot of money. Um, I remember it. I was at, I was at uh, the Ohio State Fair, and it was the end of the fair, and uh, the President of the United States was either leaving or coming into the, the city of Columbus, and uh, everything gets shut down. When the president's plane is a, a time period, I think in those days, two hours before or two hours. But there were a lot of secret service at the airport. And I had this bag of money. And it was a lot of money. And I'm walking around, and this guy walks up to me and he says, Excuse me, and he flashes some ID. And I said, what, do you, what do you have in the bag? I said, uh, Money. <laughs> Open it up. He saw the money. He said, okay, go ahead. Get out of here. And that was it. <laughs> you didn't think you were a drug dealer or something? No. They weren't drugs in those days. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, run about, this, this was a long time ago. <laughs> one thing, you know, your book, you know, The Salesman of the Century, I thought was phenomenal. One thing that shocked me from it was how open you were about the personal stuff. 
you know, you, you talk about your parents and how you went to a foster home. Mm. Foster home and an orphanage. And yeah. To me, they're very, yeah. very similar. Um, it, it's, you know, those things are tough stuff. It, but let me go back to, to Wynn. Yeah. Wynn's got a disease called retinitis pigmentosis. He can't drive. It's a, he can hardly see. And yet he's driven. And you can't talk about it. Um, he, I watched him get in off his yacht into his little tender, and he didn't want any help. And I'm just scared to death that he's going to just trip and fall. Right, right. And uh, uh, amazing. Blindness is uh, just a terrible, terrible thing. And he's had it a greater portion of his life. And yet, look what he has accomplished. Right. When you go into the Wynn Hotel and the Encore Hotel in Vegas, everything is him. From the moldings in the room, so detailed. He does all the, the voice stuff when you're there. Um, just an amazing man. And the handicap that he has. Me, I, I have no handicap of any kind. Not like him. And so there are a lot of people out there that in spite of uh, some terrible things, lift themselves up and, uh, and they get the job done. Um, we'll never retire. I'll always keep in, I don't want to run a business. Um, this project, of the, of the Friar Project has some other products that I created as well um, because there's always ancillary products you want to have to sell along with the main product. Yeah. Um, and so I have this blossoming onion cutter that makes french fries and wedges lemons and a shaker that, uh, that I designed that keeps your hands clean if you if you if you cook, people know that when you're bread, chicken, fish, or meat, your hands get you're always washing and frying. Yes, yes. And this this item here keeps your hands clean when you're doing that kind of breading. Um, but I'm trying to sell the whole thing because I don't want to go back into business. As you know, I sold my business. Uh, I think in 2008, something around that, and. Uh, I just want to keep creating new products, so I'm not the one that's going to be putting this thing on TV and having customer service. No, I'm looking for a the inventor. I just want to invent more products. Yeah. I want someone else to take all these products, put them on television, go to retail with them, and um, yeah. that's my goal. We'll see. I, I want to hear about Maxwell Street days. What's a typical day when you had to be it in selling in Maxwell Street? Well, well, you didn't put on a suit. That was number one. <laughs> it was um, some of those days were cold, and Maxwell Street was only good on a Sunday. Uh, you know, when I look at some of the old black and white movies of Chicago and New York, um, with all the push carts and things of that nature, and, and that's what Maxwell Street was. It wasn't clean, um, but every Sunday people would go down that street, walk down the street, no cars, and look for cheap items used motors, uh, all sorts of stuff that you'd find at a flea market today. And it was nothing much more than a flea market. And it started early in the morning. It ended about 2.30 in the afternoon. And uh, at which time you th 
threw all the garbage away, cleaned off your tables, folded up the tables, brought them into the fish store behind you, had to deal with that smell. Of course, the fish store was closed on Sunday. Uh, I paid um, 20 or $30 a week to keep the stuff there so I wouldn't have to keep um, carrying it in, the, in my car. That would have been a, a difficulty. Um, and it was just hard work, standing. Standing in one place for long periods of time, your back hurts. It doesn't hurt. It didn't hurt then. It hurts today. Uh, I'm about, I'm about three inches shorter today than I was when I was working on Maxwell Street. When you stand, that spinal column gets, the pads disappear. And, smushed, yeah. Yeah, you get, you get shorter. Um, so don't, try not stand a lot. Take a break and sit as much as you can. It will, my voice, I remember at the end of the day, I didn't want to talk to anybody. Not as much as bad on Maxwell as the state fairs. State fairs were long hours. He started at the same time as Maxwell Street, setting up. And the fair would open up like at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. And you were ready to go at 8 o'clock because you could get there and the employees could get into the fairgrounds early. But it's those late hours till 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. It's a long day. And you don't want to talk to anybody. Some of the things I recall uh, when you get hungry and you got to take a break and eat, there was chili, chili and onions, a bowl of chili, um, corn dogs. Um, the, you know, the Wisconsin State Fair, they used to roll this husk this horn, the corn, that had some charcoal underneath it, and they used to roll it into butter. Sounds great. So good. But, as I mentioned in my infomercial, olive oil fried corn is much better tasting hmm. than the corn on the cob. That's the truth. Because I remember how it tasted, and it was good with the butter. It's better with olive oil. What did you learn from selling to the crowds? How did you modify your sales pitches throughout the years? You always, the, the presentation is basically the same all the time. Yeah. It's the, you're working the people. Who are you talking to? Who looks like they can afford and have enough interest? And so your focus of attention is with your audience. You've got uh, 50 to 75 people in front of you, and you, you look for people who can, you think can afford your product, who have sufficient interest that you can develop, with those people to buy your product and you attempt to get them down closer to you and you would say um, me, can you step over here there's a little place for you here and and she's maybe the first one to buy the product what I never did was ever have someone start the buying that worked for me but they used to call it shill that other salesmen used to use. I never had to do that. I, and another good thing is, which was a talent, not a talent, but a, we'd always keep someone who wanted to buy the product, but we would keep them to watch another demonstration. I love this part of your book, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So they would start the buying for the next demo, and you'd always have a crowd. Nobody likes to walk up to a salesman that talks to large crowds and be the first person standing there. So if there's 
always you always keep someone in front of you. How did you discover that? Because for me, I don't know if I'd be disciplined enough. The person's ready to give you their money, and uh, then you hold off on it. Yeah. How did you discover to do that? That was just passed down from generations of salespeople really? who have done the same thing in England. Uh, selling in the streets was a big thing. Hmm. And so I did not did not invent that. It was just passed down and and people still do it today. So what do you include in that presentation that works so well? Because I remember a story in your book, you're talking about you and Mel and you go and you sold $500 and he sold $8. And yeah. you probably taught him the presentation. Yes, I did. So what were you doing differently or what was working with how you did it? <clears throat> First of all, Mel did not have the dexterity of using the product as good as me. If you have to be more concerned about what you're doing, not cutting your finger off, you mean? Your finger, <laughs> then your presentation, your sales presentation is going to be lacking to, to a great degree. And so I think that had something to do with it. Uh, there, there's a variety of things. I'm not going to. Um, we, I don't know if I, we had the, I think I mentioned in the book where you, there was a contest that took place in West Springfield, Massachusetts, and we were selling knives. And my cousin Arnold, who was in my knife show that's still running today, um, and there was another gentleman, his name was, nickname was Frosty, last name was Wishon. Frosty was Sean. Frosty thought he was the best pitchman in the entire country. And Arnold could have been one of the best, certainly one of the best pitchmen in the country, certainly with knives. And I was good. And so I said, look, uh, I have this location at the Eastern States Exposition and it's a 12 hour day and we'll just rotate it for the entire 10 days. Mm -hmm. Sean, he was, he thought he had it hands down. At the end of the show, I had a little bit more money than Arnold and we had both more than doubled mm. Frosty was shot. And I remember him saying, I will never work with you ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that I had a few dollars more than, than Arnold didn't mean I was better than him. Um, it, th th those, that, that amount of money, it could have swung toward him. And, right. and so we were equal. Um, and he, uh, and he is a better knife worker. He could use a knife better than me. Mm -hmm. And his presentations were long and mine were, I could get two presentations in for every presentation that he made. So we had our different ways of doing it, mm -hmm. but the bottom line were at the end of the day, we were equal. Yeah. So what are, what were some of the most successful products of all time? All my products. Oh wait, this will be backwards. The the words will be backwards. But can you see that? Yeah, inside the shell egg scrambler. One of my favorite inventions. I didn't like. I didn't like scrambled eggs that had the slime in it, and I was destined to make a product. Not that I was going to make a lot of money on it. I really wanted to make a product basically for myself. And I did. And that product got me so much publicity, though. It actually homogenized the egg yolk and white together mm. at a needle that had a little bend in it. And when the needle spun at high revolutions, it whipped. People thought if you put an egg on a needle, the egg would crack open. Uh, I didn't know that until I tried it a bunch of times. And it didn't. So. When the egg came down, it hit a button, caused a little 
Mobuchi motor to turn around and cause that needle to spin. Opened it up, great for French toast. Because when you put the bread and the egg, it just sucked up the whole egg because there was no slime on it. Right, right. It was, and for great chefs, that's a phenomenal product. But it never really um, made big money. The Vegematic, the Pocket Fisherman. Um, I was ahead of my time with Miracle Broom, uh, only to have the Dustbuster come out with a real quality product. Um, I had Auto Cup. Now you see the cups everywhere at Starbucks. Mr. Dentist was a great product. Mr. Dennis, when I went to the dentist, he had your teeth cleaned. He came down with this arm and he had this little round thing that spun around right. and polished your teeth. So I made a, a small hand unit with a couple of batteries in it. I made an electric one. Today, you go in the drugstore, they're everywhere. Right. Oral-B, Sonicare. In the, in the, I sold a lot of them, but... I, I said in the commercial, buy a separate Mr. Dennis for your dog. <laughs> I'd go to the retriever, poor dog, and I said, okay. <laughs> I said, open your mouth. You get a cold it there so I can get this, your teeth with this thing with the camera running. Oh, uh, it's cute. <laughs> a separate Mr. Dennis so I could sell a, an extra unit marketing. That's what about the food dehydrator? How did you come up with that? Food dehydrators. We had two of them. Yeah. Uh, I had two million. <laughs> <laughs> um, food dehydrators. Um, you don't... Food dehydration has been around for hundreds of years. Indians did it. They hung out the stuff to dry in the sun. Um, designing a food dehydrator um, wasn't a difficult thing to do. The food dehydrator sales were gigantic because of what we talked about earlier when everybody watched television. And so if you're the only guy on TV with a food dehydrator and there's not a, not a, not a lot of other products and you see this product and it makes beef jerky and it dries bananas for banana chips and apples for apple snacks and horses for horseradish. <laughs> um, you didn't like that joke, did you? I know. I, I've listened to your book three times. So, I've... <laughs> oh, anyway, so yeah. it, it was simple. It worked. Nothing could go wrong with it. I read my first one was with a light bulb. What was? My first food dehydrator was with a light bulb. Instead of having a heating element in it, there's enough heat from a light bulb huh. if it's enclosed in a container to dry your foods. Interesting. It was too Mickey Mouse though to make into a giant product. And so I went to a heating element, which did basically the same thing that the light bulb did. And 50% uh, of the people who bought the food dehydrator uh, made beef jerky with it. Because hmm. the beef jerky was pretty expensive. Right. They bought it in the stores and still is today. Um, but for health food nuts, yeah. Yeah. no additives, no preservatives for the banana chips and Take your vegetables. Yeah, we made fruit roll-ups out of like natural fruit roll-ups. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great, great product. I, I loved it because of its simplicity, and uh, it was just simple. What just, was your first infomercial? What what product did you do? Ooh, could have been the food dehydrator. Um, infomercial, twenty eight minutes and thirty seconds. It could have been that. My memory's not that good. If someone's thinking about doing an infomercial, are there certain elements that people <laughs> make mistakes with or leave no. out? Don't. Don't do infomercials. No. The cost of media today, it's not like it was. 
And um, unless you have a spectacular product that the retailer will love, um, that fits in every venue, the chances of being successful and in the infomercial business is slim. It's slim. Mm -hmm. Now the people, now the the most successful people. And I'm not the most successful guy in the infomercial business, but Gunthy Renker is. Bill Gunthy and Greg Renker, two great guys. Um, yeah, proactive. Yeah, proactive. But they're in the continuity business. You buy their product at a low price, and they keep sending it to you every sixty or ninety days. Bingo, bingo, and they have a good product. And people are always getting, your audience never dies because there are more kids growing up with acne. And so as you get older, you get rid of it, but there's always a whole new audience. Yeah. And they do quality shows and they're quality guys and everything they do is for sports. Yeah. But that's continuity. Yeah. Now, continuity product, then the infomercial business is great. Um, but uh, Ron, who else do you look to as, as top of the field in marketing and you know direct marketing these direct days? Marketing. Yeah, you know, I have to say who I just mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Bill Guthrie and Greg Ranker. Um, good stuff, good product. Yeah. Good presentation. Let's face it, all presentations show you the problem, show you a solution, and you have the price. Yeah. And uh, that format won't change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ron, obviously you've had tons of success. What were some of the big mistakes that you learned a lot from? First of all, I haven't had any mistakes. I've never had a product that I didn't. Um, I've always made money. The egg scrambler didn't make a lot of money, but if you if I go over all the items with you, mm -hmm. you'd have to say winner, 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 winner. I I'm hoping the fryer with more time and money put into it will be a winner. Um, it's a worldwide product because people fry food all over the world. People are always afraid of getting burned. It will do big foods like turkey. It's the only. It's the only one that has the uh, underwriter laboratory approval on large food fryers. Mm -hmm. You might ask me about the butterball turkey fryer. Are you familiar with that? No, no, I'm not. Oh, well, you're. I'm sure some of your audience is. Uh, Sold a lot of machines. Uh, the Butterball Turkey Fryer, it's a nice size box, probably too big for someone's kitchen, but they still sold tons of them. Every major retailer carried it. And uh, their history, November the 20th, because they lost the safety, they lose their safety approval because they can't meet the new regulations. Oh. It's the only one guy out there that can meet the regulations and I'm the only one with a small fryer. So that's a good position to be in. Yeah. I hope it's a reason for someone to want to fill up all those retail stores that won't have a turkey fryer this Christmas. We'll see. I mentioned in the beginning, Ron, about uh, there was a fun fact and that most people know about you. And you mentioned there's a very embarrassing story that you had uh, early on um, with, you know what I'm talking about from your book? The most no. embarrassing part of your book where it has to do with the National Guard. Oh, well, that was, that was, yeah, that was the story that, yeah, that was my most embarrassing moment. Um, I was selling a shoe shine spray. It was clear in color. 
in those days, people weren't wearing sneakers or sandals as they do today. They had conventional shoes. And there were people who, sh so many people shine shoes for a living. And women's shoes had a variety of colors as they do today. And where do you find red shoe polish or green shoe polish or tan shoe polish? And so we started selling this shoe shine spray in an aerosol can. It was clear. And um, I think we call it penny shine. Um, and we just sprayed it on a shoe. And if you looked at the shoe that was sprayed and the one that wasn't, one looked pretty nice and the other one didn't. And we tell them how much the price was. It was two dollars for a can. And then we shine the other shoe and the customer would opt to buy it or not. And we sold a lot of them in stores. But and I was making a lot of money, but it wasn't good enough for me. I asked myself, who needs to have their shoe shined? I said, the army. Well, how am I going to get to the army? But we had a National Guard in Chicago that had a big armory near Chicago and Michigan Avenue. It's still there. And that's where the National Guard marches up and down. It's this giant block. So I said, I got to find someone to get me into this armory so I could sell all those guys marching up and down. And I had a beat up, crushed in Chesterfield truck. Chesterfield was a cigarette. And I bought this thing for 350 bucks. Um, and uh, I bought it just before I ended up finding this contact who got me in to the armory. And I walk in with my, with Mel and we'd have these cases of spray and the sergeant was, he was getting, everybody was getting paid off somehow. Um, the guy that got me in was getting so much money and he had taken care of and the sergeant said, attention at ease. Um, Ron Popeil is here. He's got this spray that's been approved by the National Guard. Wasn't approved by any. <laughs> and uh, and, we, and uh, two dollars a can, and you didn't have to, you didn't have to demonstrate it. If they could shine these boots and the shoes, they were in heaven, man. And so the, the money was thro they were throwing money at us, and. We used to come up every Wednesday and load up this truck and we're making, but that wasn't good enough for me. <laughs> that so seems I, to be a, a theme with so you. I said to yeah. this guy, my connection, yeah. um, how do I get to sell the entire National Guard? So I got to find out that I had to see the, a general if I wanted to sell the National Guard. And I said, "Is there? where's there a general? And my friend said, we have one here. He's a three-star general, and I'll set up an appointment for you. And so we set up the appointment. It was a summer night, summer daytime. And Mel and I went there. I remember knocking on the guy's door, general's door, and a sergeant opened up the door. And I saw the biggest office I had ever seen in my life. And the carpeting was royal blue. And I remember that when I put my first step in Jeremy, my foot sank way down in this carpeting. I had never, ever felt that comfort zone before. <laughs> and we walked in and the general had, was sitting behind the desk and there were two chairs in front of the desk, but they weren't, one was in front of the other. They weren't 
parallel with each other. And I sat in the, the one closest to the general and my partner with the case of, of the spray sat behind me. And I started to tell the general about how great the product was. And without asking, I turned around and took a can out of the package and or Mel handed me a can and I walked without being asked. And the sergeant is just standing there. Now the sergeant really is the general's maid. He cleans the clothes and presses it and shines the shoes and every every general has got they call them aides. <laughs> Another way of a maid aide. Basically the same thing. Right. And um, when I go around I said General, let me shine this boot over here for you. And he pulls up his pants and I spray it. I know that that glistening versus the other, not any different than in the stores where the people would compare both and say, whoa, what a difference. I knew that was going to happen. No matter how beautiful the sergeant had sprayed, had shined the general's boots. And sure enough, he's looking at it and the sergeant's glaring down. And as I'm talking to the general, I look down at the boot I sprayed and it <clears throat> turns the color of your shirt. White? As white as that. Now the general's got, <laughs> <laughs> he's got one white boot and one brown boot. And I'm, never saw that before. I didn't know what to say. I said, the shine is going to come back. Now, I don't bullshit and I don't lie. But I got to tell you, when I said that shine is going to come back, I pull that from left field. <coughs> I took and sprayed the other boot, hoping that white would disappear. But it did not. Did not. Yeah. And I said, and I got up and I said, there's something wrong with the can. That's what I said to myself. And I got up and I walked over to my partner whose mouth was open and his eyes were not blinking. <laughs> he had stood along the side to watch the presentation. He got out of the chair. <clears throat> and I grabbed the box out of his hand and I put the box in front of the general's face. And I said, pick out any can. <coughs> the general took down another can, hoping, I was hoping that whatever was wrong with that can, by choosing a new can, we would get the desired results. And then I looked at the general, I said, do you have another pair of boots? And he said, paused and looked up at the sergeant and said, sergeant, bring me another pair of boots. The sergeant did not move. Whoa, general says something and the sergeant doesn't move. And then the general got angry and he said, I said, bring me another pair. Yes, sir. And he turned around, went into a room, came out with another pair of boots. And I sprayed that boot. Uh, looked great, huh? Thank you. Must have been the can. I don't know what's going to happen with those two pictures. <laughs> I sprayed the other boot really quickly and as, uh-oh, it's starting to, t another pair of white boots. <laughs> now the general's got two pair of snow white boots. I say to myself, I gotta get out of here. Run, yeah. Never come back <laughs> So I stood up and I looked at the general right in the eye and I said, as I'm looking at you, Jeremy, I said, well, general, can I sell the national guard? He looked down at his boots and he looked at me and he said, quote, well, if it's okay with Colonel Kane, it's okay with me. I said, thank you very much, general. And I turned around and walked out with my partner, never went back again. Never sold another can of that shit again. What went wrong? We determined it was humidity. 
It was a hot summer afternoon and the humidity in the air had some effect on the spray. Mm. And that's what caused it. What happened? Who was this Colonel Kane? Colonel Kane went on to become Lieutenant Governor of the state of Illinois, got indicted, went to jail, mm. as almost, most politicians do in Illinois. <laughs> End of story. What an embarrassing moment. What mm. made you, Ron, what made you decide to ask for the order? I ask myself that today. <laughs> <Let's go. laughs> Who knew I was going to get an answer like that? That is wild. You, you would think that he would be swearing at me. And, the, and the, I always think sometimes that there's a sergeant somewhere with a paring knife. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff. Oh, just, just cussing me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a vision uh, that's a great uh, story I love that story um, Ron since the inspired insider I always ask um, what's been your in your career personally or professionally what's been your lowest moment and then how you pushed forward through it mm. you know we, there are problems that come up. Um, the rotisserie, for instance. Um, there was a low moment when I received a notice uh, from an agency in Washington to have a recall on my product. And um, I couldn't understand it. And I had built a quality machine. Um, I, I had about 200,000 machines sold. And there were 6 people involved, but only 2 serious complaints. And that agency in Washington wanted me to have recall for the entire 200,000. Wow. And I couldn't understand that. And that was a low point thinking something that's totally out of your control and what it would have effect it would have on the future of the product. And so it cost me uh, a couple hundred grand with lawyers and stuff to narrow it down to a time period that enveloped these six people. And so whatever was sold that we had documentation on in direct response, um, we contacted that small window of people and nobody returned the product. <laughs> nobody. I mean, it narrowed it down to like uh, a thousand people or something in that time period. And it was nothing. It was Washington, D Washington DC doing its stuff. Show it's working. Uh, that bothered me to a great extent. When, when you don't have control of something, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like going into a courtroom and you don't know what the outcome would be. Yeah. yeah. I, remember, uh, I remember suing Radio Shack. They copied my Mr. Microphone. Mm -hmm. To the point where if you went in to a Radio Shack store and ask them for a Mr. Microphone, they would sell you their unit. And I could not tell the difference between the two microphones. Really? And the judge favored them in the case because he didn't like my lawyers from Washington. I had friends of mine that were Washington that came out. 
he was, the judge was wired with some lawyers here and he was the most overturned judge in the Los Angeles system. I lost the case. And on top of that, they asked for me to pay their legal fee. Oh, God, that's painful. And, and the judge said yes to that, too. But I could not tell. I lost all faith in the judicial system when that occurred. That seems like it would be a big problem, people knocking other products off. Is that? On a simple product, yeah. like Mr. Microphone, um, same colors, everything was the same. Um, unfortunate situation. Yeah. And I don't, I don't blame Radio Shack for trying it. But the judicial system, that's a toughie when you can't trust the judicial system. That's what we have in this country that separates us from all these other countries. And uh, when it doesn't work, that's, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. that can get you down. Ron, on the other side, what's been one of the proudest moments? Mm -hmm. Oh. I don't, I don't, I, I have a hard time answering that. Uh, you can't please everybody. Um, I've been lucky. Um, being on, I chose the right business um, at the right time. And anybody choosing the right business at the right time has kind of an edge of being successful. Um, as I said, you mentioned infomercial business. I say stay away. Um, you got in it when I got in it. Um, you could have sold anything on TV. Being in the right place at the right time. Um, when I look back, one of my, uh, we talk about how I asked the general if I could, can I still sell the National Guard? And he came up with this Colonel Kane thing. and <laughs> What a great answer, though. Um, when I was working in the Woolworth store in Chicago, long hours, live demonstration, yeah. talked to uh, 800 to 1,000 people a day, made good money. And then someone said to me, Ron, do you know that you can make a TV commercial down in Tampa, Florida for $550? And I said, how can you do that? He says, well, the, the station has these cameras and they're not being used at night. Early hours of the morning. And that's when you do it. What motivated me to be on an airplane within that week, that to me, when I look back, that something, something made me, um, don't do tomorrow what you can do today. And I've run my life pretty much that way. Um, you got something to do, do it now. Don't procrastinate. Sounded good, do it. Don't talk about it, do it. Most people talk about it and it doesn't get done. Yeah. Yeah. You saw that opportunity. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and I look back at myself and I try to ask myself, what was I thinking? Um, yeah. What was I thinking? I don't remember. Yeah. But I, I look back and say, whoa, you sure did the right thing. That was a huge, big turning What's, point. That was the spray gun, the gun that washes and waxes your car. And mm -hmm. you put these tablets in the handle. And I stayed down, and my friend was in the insurance business in Tampa. And I used his garage and his, and his lawn. And he had these two little brats running around. <laughs> and those two little brats became big casino people later on in life. 
Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Ron, what for entrepreneurs, what's a piece of advice that they should follow or that you would have for them? Uh, just any entrepreneur out there, what would you tell them as far as in uh, in business, your uh, best piece of advice? Well, there is no such thing. There is no best. There's too many factors. Um, there's no one factor. Uh, I said, uh, if you have an idea, it shouldn't be just words or a thought. Do it. Don't procrastinate. Don't do tomorrow what you can do today. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you're going to deliver something to the consumer, Steve Wynn would say, you got to deliver the promise or it's not going to work. And you, and you got to put your time in. If you don't put the time in, yeah. it's not going to happen. The guys that are really successful today, though, are the guys that can attract top talent. So who you associate with and the ability to recognize talent of other people, that will help you um, get your job done faster, easier, and better. Yeah. Ron, I appreciate your time. I have one last question, but before I ask it, where should we point people towards? Where should they check out online? Fiveandonefriar.com. Okay. That's fiveandonefriar.com. The show is there. The uh, other products are there. Um, I designed the website. I'm, uh, I'm everywhere. <laughs> I think I'm everywhere but nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Um, the crab cakes this morning. I'll be working on that this afternoon. Yeah. Um, prepping already for the QVC airing on April 19th. And um, I look forward to that. I My chances of selling out are pretty good. I would, I would bet on that, yeah. <laughs> pretty good. Um, the, that Malcolm Gladwell interview was uh, I never knew who he was when he interviewed me and I wonder if the interview would have been different if I really knew who he was well, and I you look up to him um, he's one of those genius guys uh, amazing author um, and he, he went back to QVC with me and wanted to see all the things I really did. People just think I get on the air and just sell product. Wrong. I'm buying the food. I'm styling the food. I'm figuring out what tables have what food to show. It has to look. I'm cleaning stuff. I'm making sure we have enough electricity for everything. I do, I do it all. I'm very detailed. I, I just don't think I can trust someone else to, on the electricity that I'm not going to have enough electricity. So I make sure that that takes place. So it's quite detailed. Yeah. It's not, I'm, I'm writing another book soon. If hopefully I'll sell the project and I take notes every day from this interview. Uh, it'll go in today's uh, log. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it'll, uh, it'll be a much better book than the last one on how to do certain things uh, and the step-by-step. Um, you have a title yet? Yeah. It's not as easy as it looks. Hmm. It's not as easy as it looks. It's easy. Yeah. You're looking. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Is it? And, and it's because I do everything. I complain about working so hard, but I enjoy it and I, and I would keep doing it. Yeah. I like that. And that's why I ask these questions because it's not as easy as it looked. When you had that turning point where you flew on that plane and made that commercial, that infomercial, you had already been selling on the streets long hours, going to county fairs. You know, no one sees that. But I made a lot of money yeah. and it was quite satisfying. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't working hard and, and, you know, just struggling. Right, right, right. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. My last question is, I know you probably get pitched a lot. Not really. You don't? People don't. with inventions? People with inventions, if they can get to me, yeah. the first thing I will say to them is, I'll try to help you, and I don't want to be your partner, and I want not partners are only good for dancing. Um. I, and I never want to accept anything. I don't believe in these kind of deals. Uh, I help you, you give me a piece of this, or I stay away from all of that. Mm -hmm. If I can help you, I'll help you. I was going to ask what the craziest invention that someone has presented you with. Oh, it's, it's something that if you took a, the back of a chair and put it under a doorknob, it would do the same thing. Wait, what? You know how you would take the back of a chair and angle it under a doorknob to prevent the door from opening up. Right, yes. I so mean, we, I don't do that often, but yes. Uh, no. Yeah, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 80 years ago, that's what people did. They took a chair, it had a doorknob, it was a round door. And they put this back of the chair, and that would prevent the door from opening. Right. It was a form of protection. Right. And some people have a U-shaped rod and what a stanchion that goes to the floor and basically did the same thing. So you know. Ron, thank you so much. You know, everyone said check out five and one fryer, and I'm looking forward to what's that? Five and one fryer. Five and one fryer dot com. Friar.com. I'm looking forward to not as easy as it looks. So uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks so very much for the interview. Thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you the greatest kitchen appliance ever made. It's called Shopomatic. The secret of this remarkable machine is every time I tap on the knob, the blades rotate automatically. That's what makes Shopomatic so amazing. The next time that you bake a cake, or if you're going to make some homemade candies or serve some of those delicious ice cream sundaes, add all the chopped walnuts, pecans, cashews, almonds you wish. It takes only seconds to add that fine richness and flavor to all your desserts. For chopping celery, place your celery under the container. A few taps, your chopping chores are over, and your celery is finely chopped. For those delicious potato pancakes, place your potatoes under the machine. A few taps, a few seconds, those potato pancakes won't fall apart. They won't be tasteless or rubbery as when you grate them. And just look how fine these potatoes are. Now, folks, I'll show you the crowning feature of this marvelous new machine. For now, you can chop three or four whole onions at one time. Here's where your chop matic will save the day for both your hands and your eyes. You chop those onions so fine, all your onions chop to perfection without shedding a single tear. For that delicious California health salad, we're going to use some radishes, we'll use some green pepper and some carrots too. We'll place some celery under the machine also. Now I'm going to place all these vegetables under the machine at one time. A few taps and down and around those six stainless steel chopping blades go, always safe and sure. Pour some salad dressing over the top. It not only looks appetizing, but it's equally delicious. Everyone likes coleslaw, everyone that is except mother. The reason she doesn't like it because she's the one that's got to make it on that old grater. And oh, the scrapes on her poor knuckles. Well, here's where your chopomatic comes to the rescue. 
Place that cabbage under the container and start tapping. You know why even the youngsters will be glad to help if you let them. And just look how fine this coleslaw is made. Why you'll never get indigestion eating coleslaw made this way. But you men will love it for just crushing ice. Place those ice cubes under the blades and chop away. Crushed ice is ideal for mixed drinks, for chilled seafoods and desserts, and for those snow cones for the youngsters, why it'll be a real treat. For that egg salad, why you can put four whole eggs under the machine at one time. Let me show you how fine and quickly you can make that egg salad. A few taps and in practically no time, you have that egg salad made just the way you want it. I know you're all wondering what this machine sells for. Well, Chopomatic will be nationally advertised for $5.98, and it's well worth it. During this special television presentation, if you order right now, the price is not $5.98, but only $3.98. That's right, just $3.98. And ladies and gentlemen, if you just use this machine for chopping your prepared meats alone, why, it'll be worth twice that much to you. You know, ham for ham salad, chicken for chicken salad, corned beef for corned beef hash. For roast beef, too, and for those chopped livers, why, it's wonderful. You chop that meat so fine, you make it into a sandwich bread, as I've done here. To clean the machine, you just rinse it in warm, soapy water. The blades are rust-proof, they're stainless steel. And as a special bonus during this television offer, you will receive with your chop -o -matic, at no additional charge, a valuable recipe book containing 50 secret recipes by world-famous chefs. Now here's your announcer to tell you how to order. <laughs>